Ian was born in England, but now lives in Auckland. After an unremarkable school life, he drifted in and out of jobs before finding his salvation in the Hampshire Police, where he began a career as a constable and later a detective. He also spent time as a tactical firearms officer, covert surveillance operative, and a national crime squad trainer. Ian transferred to the New Zealand Police in 2003, having fallen in love with the country and the Kiwi way of life. He left the force in 2006 to set up his own training and consultancy business, and now lives in rural Auckland. Still with your border colleague, colleague Willem? Yes, yes. lovely. So Ian has uh, a series of three crime books, and he is going to be reading from his first one called The Agency. Thank you. Um, this is about a quarter of the way through the agency, and uh, it's where my main protagonist, Dan Corder, is going to speak to um, a person who's able to get in some information. I went to be able that at the moment. So he says, What have you got for me? Dan saw no reason for pleasantries after the initial blow. Mr. Corder, right on time as usual, the weasel Artie Mountfield replied, trying to sound pleased to hear from the former detective again. I told you I was going to call now. Think of it as the last time you'd have to worry about me ever providing, ever seeing me again, providing you've got what I need. So? Well, it took me some doing, I can tell you, Mountfield began. I don't care if you had to sell your grandmother. Come to think of it, you probably would know in you. So, what have you got for me? I'm a changed man, Mr. Corner, honest I am. Dan sighed disdainfully. I said, get on with it. Well, you are right, Mountful began. Your Miss Stenning does not exist. There was once a Vanessa Jane Stenning, but she died within hours of her birth in 1976. From what I can see, a duplicate birth certificate was issued at the Windsor Registrar's Office in 2001. After that, there are no certificates issued anywhere around the country for Vivian, Vicky, Valerie, and there are no national insurance numbers of passports either. And, Dan Brown, there was no formal inquiry, inquiry after the death of Stephen Christopher, who died on the way to hospital. I do have a copy of a death certificate and also the hospital record if you want it. It seems he had a weak heart for years and he just overdid it. There is a note to say there were small rashes on the backs of his hands where the hair was pulled out, but that was not explained. That doesn't make any sense. Why no post-mortem? His position and money, Mountford said. It wouldn't be the first time embarrassments are concealed by people close to the deceased, making sure one didn't take place. Dan was writing as fast as he could. What else about Christopher? A very successful but dishonest investment broker. Ruined many investors and got away with it scot-free. There are reports of elderly investors especially getting completely wiped out financially, even losing their homes. He was investigated but nothing could be proved. He got struck off in 2000 by the association that regulates the brokers for gross misconduct. There were even questions asked in Parliament, but it all came to nothing. Mountford's tone suddenly changed. Now, I did find out something quite interesting about Vicky Stenning. If it relates to me, then I already know, Dan said dryly. Well, yes, that too. But no, it's to do with Mark Singleton, the newspaper editor she worked for, Mountford said. I discovered a housing record which showed they were living together, or at least listed as joint tenants of a house in Garstone for a period from 2007 to 2008. Dan silently punched the air in elation. Until that point, he couldn't connect Vicky Stenning to the dead editor in any way other than their working relationship. Mountfield just provided what he wanted. I did get copies of all the documents. I can send them to you, Mountfield said. So there's nothing else on Vanessa or Vivian? No, it's like they never even existed in any form. Dan knew how simple it was for someone to drop off the grid if they wanted to. Ironically, it was probably easier now than in the past. With the advent of the electronic age, everything was captured on computers. If an individual was moderately careful, living a life without computers, dealing only in cash, not credit cards or bank accounts, it'd be very difficult to track them. If they put a bit more effort into it and didn't do things like buy their own house, kept a car and kept a low profile, they could disappear altogether. Originally from England. Don't hold that against me. Are there aspects of that former life in your books? Or were you happy to leave it all behind? Or perhaps you wove it through the pages? Please tell us. 
Uh, absolutely. Um, I had a remarkable career in the police, and not to use that in the writing now would be criminal. Um, and my career in the police was mainly in the UK. Um, so having all that ammunition, that research material, it's, it's definitely there. I think the English, British sense of humour is different from anywhere else in the world, and I think that comes through in some of the writing, definitely in the police work in the UK. And I don't think anybody can write anything unless it's in some way a little autobiographical. There's a bit of me in everything I write in the same ways. I know there's a bit of you in what you do. Thank you. You've written a trilogy. So I'm curious to know whether that was your intention when you first sat down to write The Agency, or how did it turn into three books? It was never an intention to write a trilogy. Um, throughout my career, I had this fascination with what motivates people to do what they do. And the idea of revenge is something that um, I wholeheartedly agree with. And I have a list, honestly, I have a list <laughs> of people that I am prepared to do anything for, to exact revenge on the people that might do them harm. And I think that's an entirely reasonable thing to do. And so the idea of revenge was what first gave me the idea to write a book and what someone might do to um, exact revenge. But when I started writing, it soon expanded. I'm going to move the microphone like that. And so that bit became the first bit, which was the agency, which basically sets the scene. It uh, introduces the character of Dan Calder, this very flawed uh, ex-British detective who arrives in New Zealand. He's not me. <laughs> and um, really? he's definitely not me. And um, it, so it sets the scene really for the, the middle book, The Second Grave, which is taken from a Confucius um, saying. Confucius said, if you embark on a journey of revenge, you should dig two, two graves, obviously meaning the second ones for yourself. Should Confucius and I ever meet, we will have to have a discussion about that because I think he's absolutely wrong. Um, and so the second grave discusses that theory, that concept of revenge and what you're prepared to do. And then the third book, which is the bit over here, um, Frozen Summer, uh, ties up some of the threads that started in the first two as well as um, solving a major um, drugs syndicate crime in the UK, which is actually based on a real event, um, something I had to deal with. Um, and hopefully um, sets the scene for future books. Um, I am still bound by the Official Secrets Act in the UK. And so when people ask if it's based on the truth or whatever, then I've got this great answer of, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Ian.